Jesus didn't establish religious freedom for his followers, nor did he try to. In fact, becoming a disciple of Christ was an invitation to persecution and martyrdom. So when we buy into the belief that if the right political party or leader is in power, we'll achieve an earthly utopia, we're falling for an illusion. Hey everyone, a very warm welcome to you here at CA Church Online. My name's John and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Let's open up the word of God together. If you're joining us for the first time today and you haven't met Jesus or you don't know who he is, I've got good news for you. We're in the middle of a series looking at the I am statements of Jesus where he introduces himself to his listeners. If I were to introduce myself to you for the first time and describe myself, I'd probably say things like, I'm Ryan, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm a pastor here at CA Church, nice to meet you. The statement I am is a statement about identity, and over the last few weeks, we've heard Jesus say, before Abraham was, I am, I am the bread of life, and I am the light of the world. Make no mistake, these are claims of divinity, as Jesus is using the same phrase, I am, as God used to describe himself to Moses in Exodus 3. Through these statements, Jesus is revealing to his audience that he is in fact God in the flesh, the second member of the triune God. And it wasn't all that subtle either. When Jesus claimed to exist before Abraham 2,000 years prior, he was claiming transcendence over time, something only true of God. So the Jews picked up stones to throw at him because they believed he was committing blasphemy. And so today, we're going to take a look at another one of Jesus' I am statements. I am the door of the sheep in John 10. Now, there's a lot going on in this passage. So before we read it, let's look back on John 9 for a moment. Jesus has an encounter with a man who was born blind. And after spitting in the dirt, making some mud, and rubbing it on his eyes, Jesus heals the guy. I wonder if this is where we get the expression, just rub some dirt on it. Now the man ends up rejoicing, worships Jesus, and follows him. What a story, right? Incredible. The only thing is, not everyone was rejoicing at this miracle. You see, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they were actually disturbed that Jesus would heal this man on the Sabbath. And they end up ridiculing the man for his testimony and throw him out of the synagogue. John 9 concludes, Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. In other words, the Pharisees are accountable to God. They know the scriptures, they serve as leaders, and yet they're guilty of getting in the way of the work of God. So as we turn the page to John 10, the setting doesn't change. The Pharisees are still part of the crowd listening to Jesus. In fact, Jesus' next words are aimed at the Pharisees. So let's read John 10 verses 1 to 10. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, 
but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would teach us what this means. We want to understand what it is that you, Jesus, are the door of the sheep. And so we ask that you would be glorified in this time together. We pray that you would show us just the depth of this truth uh, and that we would come to see you more fully as you truly are. And so God, we commit this time to you in your name, amen. Jesus was challenging the leadership of the Pharisees through this parable. Here's why. The Pharisees saw themselves as the gates to the kingdom of God. They had an earnest desire for holiness and wanted to see the nation of Israel embody a level of holiness that was typical of priests to make them distinct from surrounding nations and to get to God through the law. So they added extra biblical laws on top of God's laws in attempts to achieve this and they judged people according to how they, they followed these regulations. So for example, they added 39 categories of what constituted work on the Sabbath. And they created more rules about what to eat, what to wear, how to pray, just to name a few. It sounds very constricting, doesn't it? They wanted to honor God, but they missed the point. So in reality, this actually led to behavior modification and an external appearance of holiness that was devoid of love and grace. Now here's how Jesus describes the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verses 27 to 28. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are all full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Wow, harsh words, aren't those? See, under the Pharisees, relationship with God became about performance, self-righteousness based on works, and strict rule-keeping. This was oppressive to the people of Israel. Their teaching and way of life served as a poor example and actually damaged the flock and shut the door to the kingdom of heaven for those whom God was seeking. This was religious corruption. And this is what Jesus was calling the Pharisees out for in John 10. Where they brought death and destruction, Jesus brought life and life to the full. Jesus is essentially saying to them, I've got news for you boys. You're not the gatekeepers to the kingdom. I am. I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. What does this mean? Well, three things. Jesus is the door to salvation. Jesus is the door to security. And Jesus is the door to supplication. You see, we speak about opportunities as doors, don't we? We look back on past seasons and we can see how God opened doors for us and closed others. Eight years ago, I walked through an open door here at CA Church. I said yes to the very first internship program that was offered here, and God has blessed that. Through the internship and then the pastoral apprenticeship program, I felt my calling to ministry being affirmed and shaped, and I've had incredible opportunities to work within various ministries here at CA over those eight years. Now for yourself, you're probably grateful for certain doors that God has opened and allowed you to walk through. You're probably grateful for certain doors that God closed in hindsight, even if you couldn't see it in the moment. And there are also probably doors you've walked through that you regret as well. Well, today, we're presented with one ultimate door. The most important door we'll decide to walk through or not. The door to eternal life. The door that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, himself. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. As the door, Jesus is the way by which we must enter the kingdom of God. Salvation is found in Jesus. 
If you want to be, become part of the sheepfold of God, you have to go through Jesus. Now, we live in an age of religious pluralism where the script says that all religions lead to God. While they may look different and while beliefs may vary, each path eventually arrives at the same destination. But against this, Jesus claims exclusivity, that he alone is the door. Not a door, but the door. Remember Peter, the guy who denied Christ three times and went back to fishing when Jesus died because all his hope was lost? Well, after he encountered the resurrected Christ, when he saw that Jesus had beaten death, he became a bold church leader and proclaimed the name of Jesus wherever he went. Now, here's what he says about Jesus in Acts 4.12. It says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's saying, Jesus is the door to eternal life. Now, what is the main function of a door as we think about this? Well, it's a gateway from one domain to another. And when we put our faith in Christ, this is what happens. Here are the words of the Apostle Paul, who gave his own life to Christ when he encountered him in a powerful way. After years of persecuting and executing followers of Jesus, he says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is Colossians 1, 13 to 14. So how do you go from the domain of darkness to the kingdom? Through the door that is Jesus. How do you go from guilt and shame to forgiveness of sins? Through the door that is Jesus. How do you go from death to life? Through the door that is Jesus. There is no other savior. We'll learn more about this in a few weeks when Pastor Cam speaks on Jesus' statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But the reality is, we're presented with so many false doors claiming Savior status. These doors look appealing. They're tempting. But ultimately, they lead to our destruction and disappointment. So let's look at a few of these common ones. I've gotten a couple of them from Pastor Matt Chandler. The first is hedonism. Hedonism says that life and life to the full is found through happiness and pleasure. The goal of life is to feel good and live free from constraints that limit our freedom. We simply need to do whatever feels good so long as it doesn't harm anybody. We need to look within to discover who we are and express ourselves without anyone or anything getting in the way. The problem is, this overpromises and underdelivers. I don't think there's a quote that I've shared more in the last few years than this one, which paints a grim picture of the results of a culture bent on hedonism and limitless freedom. Mark Sayers says this, our private worlds are in crisis too. We see the rise of anxiety and mental health disorders, falling IQ levels, epidemic loneliness, and social disconnection widespread online bullying, and the persistence of discrimination, bigotry, and hatred, addiction to drugs, food, technology, sex, gambling, and relationships are widespread. Obesity is rising, becoming a full-blown health issue. In the West, poor mental health is now normative among emerging generations. Life expectancy in the West's two most powerful nations, the United States and the United Kingdom, has fallen for the last three years running. With all these factors in play, we can see how many are having their moment of doubt, for the post-Christian revival seems to be running aground. And he goes on to say that we're drowning in freedoms, but we're starving for meaning and relationships. That we actually need to sacrifice some of our freedoms and pursuits of pleasure to gain meaning and relationships. You see, hedonism is narcissistic. It leaves little room for sacrifice and ultimately leaves us feeling a few physical pleasures at the expense of lasting purpose and fulfillment. As the quote I just read suggests, hedonism is a lie that is not working. Now, the second door is the door of self-salvation. This is where rule-keeping, morality, and self-effort are seen as the keys to salvation. 
This is the dominant system of thought of most world religions. If you do enough good, if you follow the rules, you'll make it. And the funny thing is, most people form their own moralistic view of salvation based on what they're good at. When you believe that you are the door, you tend to measure your morality according to your strengths rather than your weaknesses. Now the thing is, the church isn't immune to moralism and self-salvation. You see, if we can work hard enough to perform for God, maybe he'll accept us through prayer. Maybe it's behavior modification, serving, tithing, the list goes on. This is what the Pharisees were actually guilty of. Religious performance, following the law to save themselves. But we aren't supposed to save ourselves. We simply need to walk through the door to salvation by putting our faith in the work of Jesus. All right, what's behind door number three? It's the economic savior. This is the green pastures made of dollar bills. We live in an expensive part of the world. There's no denying that. We can understand why this is a formidable false savior in our context. Many do struggle to get by, and it's true that a certain level of income is needed to live sustainably in this city. But this isn't what I'm talking about. If our God is money, we'll never have enough. Very few people are content with what they have. They think, if only I can hit a certain dollar figure in my account, I'll finally live the good life. If only I can make that much, I can protect myself. Money provides a sense of control, but that control isn't as stable as you think it is. Markets fluctuate, crises happen, and the online fraud scams are rampant these days. Now for others, money isn't as much security as it is a status symbol. It doesn't even have to be money, it could be stuff. You see, consumerism says that we will be saved from mediocrity and boredom if we have enough stuff. We'll be respected or admired by what we possess. Now, John Mark Comer has this quote, he says, the French sociologist Jean Baudrillard has made the point that in the Western world, materialism has become the new dominant system of meaning. He argues, atheism hasn't replaced cultural Christianity, shopping has. Our pursuit of money, stuff, and status reveals something much deeper about our souls. And we can't solve the longing of our souls through materialism. We can't take our stuff with us when we die. But Jesus says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Okay, door number four looks really good. A lot of people walk through this one. This is the door of political saviors. And this is what the disciples of Jesus initially thought Jesus would be. The one who would deliver them and the nation of Israel from Roman oppression through political and military might. But Jesus didn't establish religious freedom for his followers, nor did he try to. In fact, becoming a disciple of Christ was an invitation to persecution and martyrdom. So when we buy into the belief that if the right political party or leader is in power, we'll achieve an earthly utopia, we're falling for an illusion. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't get involved in politics or seek to advocate for policy changes? No. Am I saying you shouldn't have political leanings or convictions or do your research? No. Am I saying you shouldn't put your hope in worldly power? Yes. This might be news for some of you, but the Christian faith doesn't fit into a certain political party or even slide toward one end of the political spectrum. Now, before you email me, you should know that I'm leaving for vacation on Monday for a few weeks. So I probably won't get back to you till the end of August. So with all that being said, here's what I mean. According to historian of early Christianity, Dr. Larry Hurtado, in his book, Destroyer of the Gods, the church was characterized by five things that made her stand out from the empire. So here's, here's what they are. Are you ready? Number one. The church was multiracial and multi-ethnic with a high value for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Number two, the church was spread across socioeconomic lines and there was a high value for caring for the poor. Those with extra were expected to share with those with less. Number three, the church held life as sacred and resisted things like infanticide and forms of abortion. Number four, 
The church was resolute in its vision of marriage and sexuality as between one man and one woman for life. And finally, number five, it was nonviolent, both on a personal level and a political level. Now, the first two of these are traditionally liberal positions, while the second two are traditionally conservative positions, and the last one just doesn't really fit into either. So thus, Orthodox Christianity doesn't fit neatly into political categories. So what's my point? My point is, our allegiance is to Christ and not to political saviors. Before we're Canadians, we are citizens of heaven. And so come what may, we can rejoice because our hope is in Christ and not in earthly national leaders or the outcome of, of an election or the laws of the land. The humanist idea of utopia is a myth, but the offer of eternal life is a reality. Jesus is the door by which we can be saved. So which false savior are you trusting in? Which door are you knocking on? What lies behind those doors ultimately provides a fleeting sense of security and food that leaves you feeling hungry. But the true security and supplication are two of the benefits that come with salvation in Christ. As the door, not only is Jesus the way to salvation, he is also our source of security and supplication. You see, the sheep who enter through Jesus, they find pasture, life, and abundance, our text says. Jesus doesn't provide the dead grass of false saviors. His way does not lead to death and destruction. In Jesus, there is life, intimacy, belonging, identity, and protection. His sheep are nourished, satisfied, provided for, and protected. Now remember how the Pharisees saw themselves as the doors or the gatekeepers to the kingdom of God, but in reality they destroyed the sheep? <clears throat> yeah, well, when Jesus is talking about the thieves and robbers who climb in by another way, he's talking about them. In verse 10, he says, they come only to steal and kill and destroy. These false saviors are no shepherds at all, but instead harm the sheep. They don't enter through the door. They transgress boundaries of protection to steal and harm the sheep. Now, it's important to note that in verses 1 to 5, the setting Jesus describes is within a village where the multiple, multiple sheep flocks would actually be kept in a courtyard and a gatekeeper would allow shepherds into the courtyard to gather their flock and lead them out. And this is why the imagery of a thief makes sense. One who wouldn't go through the gatekeeper because he wouldn't let him, but would climb in over a wall. But here's the interesting part. <clears throat> Jesus seems to switch the setting, starting in verse 7, to the wilderness. Now, the wilderness was often a place of danger. There were wild animals, flash floods, uh, cliffs, and harsh conditions that shepherds had to protect their flocks from. Now, sheep pens in the countryside were often stonewalled and had no gatekeeper. The shepherd would lead the sheep out into the pasture and back into the pen through an opening in the wall. So since there was no true door, the shepherd himself acted as the door. He would actually sleep across the entrance at night. Now with this picture in mind, we can see how Jesus, as the shepherd door, keeps the flock safe from outside threats and only allows the sheep out of the pen under his supervision. The sheep go in for protection and they go out for pasture. In for security, out for supplication. Now maybe you've walked through the door of salvation, but you're in a season where you don't feel the supplication and security of God. You don't feel nourished or protected. Instead, you feel weak and exposed. Well, here's the truth. Jesus doesn't necessarily protect us from hard seasons, but he protects us in them. It's not that we'll never face trials or difficulties or hardship. It's not that we'll never have desert seasons or experience pain, but it's that in the midst of your pain, Jesus comes alongside you. He walks with you, sustains you, uplifts you, identifies with you. Why? Because he has walked that path himself. He endured physical pain. He experienced abandonment from his friends. He experienced false accusations, hatred, and rejection. Just the other day, I was reading in Luke chapter 4, and I realized that 
After Jesus' first sermon, the religious leaders wanted to throw him off a cliff. How's that for a first day in the pulpit? Jesus knows suffering and he promises not to abandon you when you encounter difficulties of your own. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, it's when we are weak that he is strong. His grace is sufficient for us, for his power is made perfect in weakness. In Psalm 23, the shepherd doesn't remove the valley of the shadow of death for his sheep. Rather, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jesus is with us in the valley. When death and shadows surround us, he's protecting us, he's comforting us, he's strengthening us. And so we need not fear evil because the Lord is our protector. Through Jesus, we enter and find rest, protection, provision, life to the full and salvation. So if you're not a Christ follower yet, but you've seen the emptiness of false saviors, and you're pondering whether to walk through the door that is Jesus, I want to let you know that Christ is already pursuing you. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus has already taken the first step. He's knocking on your door. He wants relationship with you. Will you open the door to him and allow him to introduce himself to you before you walk through his door? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this truth, that Jesus, you are the door of the sheep, that in you there is salvation, there is eternal life, there is life and life to the full, there is abundance, there is protection, there is green pastures. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are trustworthy. God, I pray that you would show us where we've been looking to false doors or false saviors for these, these things, for protection, for life, for fulfillment. And Lord, would you just slowly pry our grip off of these things? Lord, would we turn to you? Would, would we fix our eyes upon you and see you in all of your beauty? And Jesus, we thank you that you, you take the first step towards us, that you're knocking on our door. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to draw us to yourself. Jesus, thank you for who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, in the love of Christ I'll stand In Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless faith This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live.
body lay, light of the world by darkness lay, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory. that's everything we have for you here this week at CA Church Online. I do want to say this, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, it's a really great way for you to stay connected with what's happening here online at our church. Also, if you're new, check out Next Step and head to cachurch.info. You can click the I'm new or newish button, fill in a form, give us a bit of your information if you'd like someone from our church to reach out to you and to connect that way. Well, everyone have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week.